I hope that was a blessing. I thought it was, I almost didn't do that process of reading. I mean, I, I looked at what I wanted to do and I kept going, okay, this is the verse I want to get to. And I kept going back and back and back till I ended up all the way at the beginning of chapter nine. And I thought, you know what? What a journey that would be to understand. Because I wanted you to understand the mindset when the instruction to tithe came. See, it didn't just start off with, okay, guys, we're making a vow, and okay, start bringing your money to the storehouse. No, it went through this huge process of the, remembering the journey and then saying, because of that, we should be putting, getting back to the tithing and the offerings that are necessary to support and strengthen the ministry, which then would strengthen us all in the Torah, etc. See, tithing is not just about money. It's simply a piece of the puzzle that tests where your heart is at. It's only a measuring stick of where your heart is at in terms of your obedience and willingness to obey in all things. Because I promise you, if you get rebellious, one of the first things you're going to stop doing is putting the money. That's one of the very first things you're going to do. If you're not in belief anymore, if you're not agreeing with something, why would you support it? Why would you give any money to it? It's the very first thing. And so you'll see that often. I have people that have left our ministry, and guess what they stopped doing? They stopped sending the money. That's one of the ways I know sometimes that someone has left, even if they haven't told me they left. Because that'll happen first. I'll see that. And it's okay. You're on your journey. But I want you to prayerfully consider your journey in relation to him, because he'll provide what we need one way or the other as he always does. But what's your part in it? Amen? Amen. All right, so we call this the afterburn. If you have comments or questions uh, about this teaching specifically, uh, and hopefully just about this part, part three, but if it has to do with part one or two, I may entertain that as well. I don't want this to go too long. Um, if you have anything that we don't get to cover during the afterburn, you are always encouraged and welcome to contact the ministry directly. Okay, our phone number, email, all that stuff is all on our website, mtoi.org, and you're always welcome to contact us directly. Okay, um, Dawid, go ahead and get us started. Um, a comment and a question. Uh, first, the comment. Uh, it was actually in support of what you had said about, um, you mentioned that you thought we needed to return to Torah before we returned to the land. That's actually uh, cited directly as a prophecy um, in Deuteronomy 30, 2, verse, uh, two through 7. Um, so I just wanted to give that back up to what you had said. Uh, number two, the question, um, if you can, this might actually be an individual thing where people need to counsel with you, but please define how far we need to separate and please describe all the levels that we need to separate from them, i.e. the foreigners. For example, it's easy to understand not, being, uh, not becoming unequally yoked in marriage. What other relationships should we not enter into and or separate ourselves from? I think what you want to make sure is just be aware of everybody that you interact with that's not part of the body, the level of influence they have on you or you have on them. Because it's not so much me to give you a list of people to avoid, because <clears throat> the people that you need to avoid, only you would know. But you're not going to know unless you turn up your awareness. You've got to tune your awareness up. Turn that up to a high level where you can start to notice, for example. By the way, if you have a spouse in the body, your spouse can notice that maybe when you hang out with the guys or, or maybe the husband knows when you hang out with the ladies that you start all of a sudden acting a little different for a period of time. Because there's a certain level of lingering influence that still hangs out there for the next week or the next day or whatever it is. And so they can tell. My wife knows when I've been on the phone with my friends from New York because my accent gets much thicker. <laughs> so for a couple hours, I'm talking like this, you know? I'm kidding. It doesn't get that bad. But it does get stronger. And that's just something as simple as the influence of hearing that accent in my speaking with friends will then turn that a little thicker. Some of you have the opposite where you have friends that are much more Southern. And so the, when, you, when your spouse hangs out with their family or friends that have a much thicker Southern accent, all of a sudden they sound a little bit more Southern. Whatever that is, that's just an accent. 
What else are they influencing you if you spend time with them? Are they influencing you on how you think and how you focus and what you believe and what you do? Are they strengthening or weakening your relationship vertically? Only you know that. And so I have friends outside of the body, but I spend an incredibly small amount of time with them. I mean, like, maybe once or twice a year we have contact. I don't have people outside the body that I spend very much time with. I'm hoping someday that they're knowing me will be well enough that if he ever wakes them up and opens their eyes and ears, they know I'm a guy they can go talk to. So they know what I'm doing and what I'm up to enough for that. But I spend very little time in the influence or the environment where I might be influenced with other people that are not walking this out the best they can. That's one of the reasons why I like our Facebook groups or our Marco Polo groups because it's a place for those in the body to work and walk and play and discuss and just hang out and spend the kind of social time that they don't get to do anymore with their outside the camp friends. I used to, some people call them worldly, but I, I hate that term. It's a terrible term because they're not necessarily, worldly to me is someone choosing to act in that sort of way. They're just where they are. They're outside the camp. Okay, they're not, they weren't put outside the camp. They just never came in. And so I would limit my time to that. Well, but some of you are socially starving to death. Well, let's figure out how to way to meet that need in the body. Okay, you know, very few of you show up to our general sessions. But the general session is one of the things we do at the beginning of every general session is we have everybody in the group put some way to contact each other into the meeting so that there's a way either by Facebook or email or something where people can actually reach out and start to get to know each other. You know, we've got one family in Canada that is on right now, I'm sure, that they've made the effort to then reach out to people that they've started to meet and get to know, and they actually do scheduled Skype meetings with them. They have little Skype, little social times where they'll meet and Skype with people. And they meet, like they know Tuesday night they meet with this one and Wednesday night they meet. And they just have this thing scheduled so they're Skyping. And look, it's not the same as being there together, but it's better than when you were sitting alone by yourself. I mean, there's things we can do creatively to make that. I can promise you there are guys that makes, it makes all the difference and the ladies to be on the Marco Polo thing that we were doing. That even though some of you might complain there's so many posts and stuff, but for some of the people, it makes them feel like they're not disconnected and alone. So we as a body need to do something to do that. So I can't answer your question with specifics because that would be a very sort of cultish thing to do. You need to avoid this person and that person and this person. No, you need to figure out who is dangerous in your life because of the level of influence. Now, it might not be the most dangerous person in your life is actually the person doing the worst things because they may not have any influence on you. You already know they're doing terrible things you have no interest in. It's the person that's most close, but not quite, that's probably the most dangerous that you have to be careful about. Because it's always going to be one of those not clear, it won't be clear as to which one is influencing the other more. Those are the ones to watch out with. So I'm not saying get rid of all your closest friends. I'm saying you have to be careful and understand what level of awareness you have then to what your nature of your relationships are. And the simple thing is how much influence... And in case you don't see it, ask your spouse if you have a spouse. Ask your best friend if you have a best friend inside the body. Hey, have you noticed anything? Who, who do you think are my biggest influences? Maybe the, ask the person. They may say, well, you know, you're really influenced by your mother. Or you're really influenced by your brother or your sister. Or you're really influenced by this coworker that you mention all the time. If you're not sure who's influencing you, ask somebody that knows you real well. Because guess what? You'll talk about it enough. Well, you know, my mom said this. Or, you know, Johnny said that. Or, you know, you'll talk about it enough that people will realize that person's a strong influence. That doesn't mean it's bad, by the way. Then you get to ask the question, I wonder if that influence is a good one or not. Is that being fair? Okay, that's my guidelines or criteria I would give you. So good question. Yeah, I just uh, couldn't help but uh, think about what well, he's going through this and Nehemia about Yosef and uh, bringing them into the storehouse and the uh, rebuke and devour. That was what essentially happened there. And, you know, we as a body, the one thing that really hit me really hard some years ago was Devery made 18. You know, why does he give us power to get wealth? It's to establish the covenant. You know, 
it's um, it's necessary for us to do this so that we can actually build a a body that's actually there for us, just like Yosef. Um, had the people not brought essentially um, a tithe, if you will, then there would have been nothing there for the seven years of the famine. And it was him who brought and had the vision who was able to hear um, from, from Abba what they should do to during those seven years of good to mm-hmm. prevent and to hedge against that when the devourer would come. So, you know, that is the purpose. And this is one thing that I've seen with an M2I that, and, you know, shameless plug, whatever, but it's not prevalent in most of the body or messianics or whatever, that we have a structure, we have leadership that we can go to, and we should be supporting it because it is what provides what you're benefiting from right now. And without that support, you don't have a live stream, you don't have a tour study, you don't have um, a, a general session, the connections and the things that has grown in the time I've seen it. I mean, from the days of Pal Talk, which was pretty much about it, right. to today, and the, the spread and the growth that you see in different countries and things, and people who are actually able to connect and would not would not know each other or have that had it not been for this body and what has been able to be done and provided for by the leadership because of the, the support. I mean, I appreciate that. And by the way, when you look at the Egyptian situation with Yosef, what would have happened if the people had not given the grain during the years of plenty? There would be no deliverance during the year of famine. And so when you're going to end up at a point where you need and then you're going to be all frustrated when there's nothing to give you because you didn't give and others didn't give when they had, that's part of the problem as well. But also the appreciation. Look, we've gotten a lot of comments from the live stream that they appreciate the multiple cameras we have now. Well, we've got probably, I don't know. Marty, how much do you think we have in all of the equipment period? Do- give me a dollar. We probably have $15,000 just in video equipment alone just for the live stream. Okay? And we were able to do that because people did supply that kind of a funding so that we could enhance. Now, again, it's not about putting a great production together, but it's to enhance the people out there feeling like they're here. And the more that we, and some of you that are here who do the live stream know that since we added the other cameras, it it gives you even more of that feeling. Okay? Because some of the ones back here are saying absolutely, and there are people that that generally watch the live stream, but they're here this week. And so that's you benefiting from your tithes and offerings. We used it not to buy me, you know, a Rolls Royce, but we used it to buy you some cameras so that we can do this kind of thing. Okay? And so that's our goal is to make this as much a connectivity point and virtual as we can. I've watched other ministries, excuse me, I've watched other ministries over the year that have a live stream. And you might as well watch a recording. It's no different. There's no way to interact. There's nothing that shows them acknowledging that we're even watching. We try to make this as virtual as we can. That's why Robert's now going to take the mic and he's going to read some questions from the people out there. And so they know they are actually being acknowledged. That's why we wave at the end. Do you guys appreciate that? We all wave at the end. Okay? Because that's us acknowledging you. Because we appreciate that we have the opportunity to be here. We also appreciate that you'd love to be here, but you don't have a place like this. And it's the funding that provides that. Kara? Um, So in Nehemiah 9, 13, it talks about the straight right rulings, Torah of truth, and good laws and commands. Um, I guess a lot of people that I interact with, um, I think this is in Christianity, but it's also, I think, the mindset of people in general, this idea of, like, the relativism of truth, like, truth is relative, depending on your perspective, on your beliefs and whatever, there's no really right or wrong, it's just, I don't know, I don't really know why people think that, but I guess it's kind of hard to interact with people sometimes who believe that way, and I, I just was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Okay, take them as we did today to Malachi 3, 5, and 6 and show that there's no relativism there. Yahweh said, I'm against this, and I don't change. So he gets to decide what's right and wrong, 
and it doesn't change relative to anything. He says, I don't change about that. He says, so Sabbath keeping is right, murdering is wrong. Okay? Okay, feast keeping is right. Okay, stealing is wrong. I mean, just on, you just keep, you know, he gives you rights, he gives you wrongs. Honoring mother and father is right. Okay? Committing adultery is wrong. These things are not relative and don't need, there's nothing to change with them. He says, I'm against, I'm for. And I don't change. What's changing is the pride thing. This is where they are in their pride trying to spin and twist because it's inconvenient to do what he said in my life as it is right now. Now, if you've already changed your life around, it's not inconvenient at all. But if you're in that beginning stages and you've already been walking along in a certain way, switching to his way is not necessarily convenient. I, did, I have one guy that used to come to our Bible studies when we used to do them live and in person years and years ago. And he never came to Sabbath because, after all, you know, he had his tennis game that he played every Saturday and didn't want to give up his tennis game. That would be inconvenient. And he was a big to-do in his church. And, you know, he's a big guy on Sunday and he, that was inconvenient. And so he felt he had the freedom, quote-unquote, that Messiah gives you, but yet he still wanted to study Torah. But he, I, he was this conundrum to me. He was this, sort of this weird sort of mix. So he would come to some things, but not to others. But it was not, ultimately it turned out when I talked to him that it, it clashed with the things that he liked to do, that he was comfortable with as part of his life. And so that's where the relativism comes in. And so, and by the way, that's also where those people need to go find the anointed appointed that are available and allow them to answer the questions of this thing that I'm thinking of doing or not doing, am I spinning it or is that correct according to Torah? By the way, I get questions, so does Robert, because he answers the calls a lot too. Robert, we get those kind of questions, don't we, at least five times a day. Is this what Torah says or am I spinning things? Or, that's a regular question, but isn't it nice to have somebody to call? The problem is most people don't call. They just make their own call. I just make my own decision on it. And I'm just going to do what I want to do. And I'm just going to decide he's okay with it. Because I've had people say to me over the years, well, I'm sure he's okay with it. And I always looked him in the eye and said, you better be right. I don't happen to think you are, but you better be right. Because if you're wrong, you're in trouble. Oh, I'm sure he's fine with that. Because he understands that he wouldn't want me not to have a job and not be able to take care of my family. I'm like, what makes you so sure that if you lost your job, he couldn't give you a better one or at least the one equally? Why do you say that he couldn't give you a job? Why do you say that he couldn't do this or couldn't do that or couldn't? Well, he wouldn't want me to do it. He wouldn't. He tells you what he doesn't want you to do. <laughs> he doesn't want you to do what you're about to do because what you're about to do is against what he said. But you're trying to do the relativism to say, well, all things being relative... Okay, we balance things out. Well, you know, I know he wants me to keep the Sabbath, but I've got this great job that pays real great, and he wouldn't want me to lose that, and I get double pay on Saturday or time and a half, and blah, blah, blah. He wouldn't want me not to have that. Well, no, he wants you to have the abundance, but not at the expense of obedience. So let's find a way to be obedient and still get the abundance. And, don't, and if you don't know how that works, do the obedience first and leave the other part to his problem. It's not your problem and how the abundance is going to come. That's his problem. And he's happy to have that problem. Your problem is to obey and trust the emunah part, the trust, the belief, the faith. If you get your part done, stop worrying about how it's going to work out. You're, just always remember you're the Israelites standing there in front of the water with the rocks on either side and the Egyptians behind you. It's okay not to know how it's going to work out. You just have to know it's going to work out. And that's what Moses told him. Be still and trust and know it's going to work out. Okay, do what you can. Make your efforts. Make do the things that you know to do. Knowing and, and even though you can't see it, knowing it's going to still work out. He's already done so many things in your life you couldn't see. Why isn't that enough proof? Let's go back to Nehemiah. Let's go in our own personal lives and review our life history. And all the things that he's already done for him. Think about where you would be right now if he had not disturbed your peace when he did. Where would you be right now? Some of you have been doing this for more than three or four or five years. You know exactly how bad that might be and the messed up place you may have ended up and the things that you would be doing right now. But he disturbed your peace and pulled you out of all that. There's a miracle right there. Because how many of you, and you can put your hands up, 
If I had told you this before that moment, that you'd be here right now, would have said, there's no way in you know what, that that would ever happen. Okay? So you couldn't see any way this was going to happen, that you'd be here right now. Walking in Torah, keeping commandments, eating the way you do now, not doing Christmas and Easter, doing the holy days, keeping Shabbat, or even being in anything religious at all. Some of you had no, no vertical connection whatsoever. And you couldn't have imagined you would be in a vertical connected place. Well, there's your miracles. He's done it in your life. He's showing you things that you never could have expected. None of you probably were voted in high school as most likely to end up in a messianic congregation. I can promise you, nobody ever thought I'd be standing up here teaching this stuff who knew me back in high school, that's for sure. And I have friends that know me almost back that far that still get cracked up going, and people listen to you? Because <laughs> you know me as the rabbi. They didn't know me this way. They knew me as the goofball teenager, right? Now I'm still the goofball, but I'm a rabbi. But anyway, those of you in the Marco Polo group know that's still true. But the thing is, these are people that couldn't picture you, you know, doing these things. Your family's that way. You're confusing them terribly because they just can't imagine how that could happen, that you could end up where you are now. But by the way, neither can you necessarily. There's a point in every one of our lives, if anybody would have told you this is where you would have ended up, you would have been like, that's impossible. No way, never. There's your miracle. All right, Robert. Okay, we have from Thomas Lasordo. Uh, Malachi 3.16 is the book of remembrance, the same as the book of life in Revelations, and also in Malachi 3.11, is the devoured locust, or is it Hasatan? Okay, um, I don't think it really matters for us to really be able to nail down for sure what the devourer is, but it just means whatever is going to be taking away your abundance, he's going to prevent that from happening. Because I really don't know, it doesn't make it any clearer than that. Okay? But it certainly could be like it was with the locusts or the famines and the other things that devour. I don't think we have to necessarily spiritualize it. But I think it's more literal that it's going to, he's going to protect you from losing your ability to create the wealth you need to provide your needs. And then as far as the book of remembrance, it's not clear what that is. It simply says that those who fear him, what we talk about is written down. So you better be aware of that, by the way. <laughs> you know, if you fear him and you're doing the right things, a book of remembrance. In other words, so there'll be a book for maybe those in the millennium to read what those who believe in him said to each other in their, in their belief. The conversations of encouragement in their belief. So I don't know that we can necessarily connect books specifically like that. So it could be connected in some way, but I think it's simply, like it says, a book of remembrance. It's a documentation that could be used just like we have the other books of the scripture. Maybe there'll be a book of the scripture with your name on it in the millennium where it talks about the things that you talked about. Hmm, wouldn't that be interesting and cool? Who knows? And by the way, you wouldn't have to write it. It says it's already being written. And so that's being documented. I, tell, I, I made the joke many, many times over the years that Big Brother is watching you, even though we've passed 1984, but Big Brother is watching you all the time. And now we know that when we're talking, and with those of us who fear him, he's documenting all that stuff. <laughs> she goes, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Pretty scary stuff, but it's exciting stuff. Robert, go ahead. Uh, Janny wants to know, if you are not to tithe on disability, but only give that as a gift, do you still get blessings like those who tithe, and is the gift a test as well? Okay. Blessing comes from obedience, and you are also told to offer. We're told about the maaser, which is the tithes. We're also told about the truma, which is the offerings. Now, today and through these teachings, we've mostly been talking about the tithing. But we did talk about that there's offerings as well. And especially when he talks about every year when we talk about the three, uh, the Shalosh Regalim, the three pilgrimage feasts, you're told to not come empty handed, to bring an offering. And so blessing doesn't come from, but let's not turn this into a health wealth gospel thing. Blessing doesn't come because of the money, blessing comes because of the heart of obedience. 
Blessing in Deuteronomy 28 says, and if you obey, all of these blessings will overtake you. So let's not worry about it. If you are obeying and, it, and you are giving nothing because you have nothing. But by the way, we have a verse we're going to read about that little widow and her two mites. So we're going to get an understanding of that. But she made an offering so yes, you can make an offering. You always have the ability to make an offering. And it can be your, you know, 50 cents or your dollar or your $2. And that's okay. It's the obedience. It's coming from the heart. And so even if it's not financial at all because you're not in a place. Because remember, that we're supposed to deal with the widows, the orphans, the poor. Well, guess what? Those are people that don't have. And so if they don't have, then they don't have anything to give from that point of view, but they can still obey, they can still not steal, not commit adultery, keep the Sabbath, love their neighbor as themselves, love their creator with all their heart and being. Obedience is what brings blessing. We good? Okay, so let's not connect it to the money, except that the money is a part of the obedience. And so when you're not doing the money, then you're being disobedient. It's just one, look, we could be talking about, like we did the other week, about Shabbat keeping. By the way, keeping Shabbat brings blessing, disobedience brings cursing. It's just one of the many millions, well, not millions, let's have 613 things he tells us to do and not do. Now, I know there aren't necessarily exactly 613, but that's just your sort of example. But it's the obedience that brings, what? The reaping and sowing, which, by the way, we are going to teach about that next week. We're going to talk about reaping and sowing and the widow's might and some of the verses in the New Testament that deal with these things, Okay. So we have that coming. And actually, I was pretty glad we got exactly done today what I was hoping to. So next week, we start with the Birch Kadashah. And so we finished exactly where I was hoping for today. I brought more in case we had time, but we didn't. Anything else, Robert? Uh, yeah, I have three more. Um, from Carrie Gephardt. Uh, what about our children in public schools, and should they hang out together? She's talking about elementary school age. Okay, so this is part of why I did the blessing today over the children. It was actually Manny's turn, but I wanted to make sure to say something because of things that have been coming up over the last, I don't know, six months or so, especially because my children are now teenagers, are more, were more aware of what happens with teenagers. But I talked to a lot of parents of teenagers. Our teenagers are really in a place that's a million times worse than when we were teenagers. I don't even want to say that just because I'm like so old and I don't remember but they have what we did not have, which is instant, constant connectivity through things like this, through a phone, through a computer, through a tablet. And so they don't have the distance that we had with only the local people in our neighborhood that we could run into on a regular basis. And then once you went home from school, you didn't see anybody or talk to anybody. Because also when I was a teenager, it wasn't free and unlimited to call people. Matter of fact, it costs more for me to call Manhattan from Queens than to call Iowa from Queens. Or, I mean, local long distance was actually more expensive than real long distance, like to call Florida or something. It was crazy. But that's when they used to charge differences depending on where you were calling and everything else. And so our children have access to the evil net. <laughs> the Internet's got a lot of great things. That's how we're able to do this. But boy, does it have access for the unsupervised and unguided and unrestricted to have access to every possible bizarre thing. And not only bizarre thing, we're not even talking about the extremes, but you have people out there that are absolutely very strong atheists, very strong uh, believers in, in um, things that are not Yahweh, whatever it is. And they can find these people's channels and all their teachings. And now we're finding them, when we talked about earlier about influencers, you as parents, first of all, let me tell you this. You have no idea what your children are doing. Don't tell me you're, I'm a liar and don't tell me I'm wrong. You just don't know. Unless you have them with you 24-7 and have access to all of the possible electronics that they can get their hands on, you don't know what they're doing. Stop being naive. That's just the truth, period. I know much more now what my children are doing than a week or two ago because I took it all away and I have complete control over it at the moment. And not to punish them, but because I started to realize that I didn't have enough supervision. 
You homeschoolers have the biggest challenge because your children to homeschool, a lot of them are doing it online, and you have no idea what else they're doing when they're doing their homeschooling. Unless they do it right in front of you and you never leave their side and they can't click on anything when you're not there. So I want to tell this to Carrie and others that are asking this question, you need to know who your children's influencers are. And you might be shocked and appalled to find out it's not you. You're not necessarily their prime influencer. They have friends. They have internet gurus or whatever. They've got whatever they've got. And these are the ones that for some reason are now their influencers. By the way, that happened to us too as teenagers, but we had to interact with them when we, the few times we could see them in person. So there was time away from that. So there was a little bit, a little bit more of a chance to keep that from going too bad. A little bit. Sometimes not much, because some of us grew up as latchkey kids. You know what I'm talking about? Right? You had the key, and you had to go home on yourself, and both parents were working. Or as, as we used to call it, a garage key. The garage key, you know. <laughs> with the New York accent. Hey, you got a garage key? But you had the key, and you could get in the house, and you let yourself in. And the parents had no idea what you were doing until they came home at 5 o'clock or 5.30, whatever it was, 6 o'clock. You were on your own. See, but when I was on my own, I didn't have the internet. I didn't have a way to text, talk, and everything else with all my friends at 12, 13, and 14. Actually, they didn't even have car phones when I was 12, 13, and 14, I don't think. Those big box things you carried over your shoulder, right? Those phones, remember those monstrosities? You know? Yeah. I mean, we still had the black and white TV with the, the vice grip pliers to change the channels. So you guys laugh because you did that too. How many of you had a vice grip pliers on your TV at some point? There you go. Because <laughs> some genius decided to take the, one, the knob or the, or the place that it put on, the, the piece that it went onto, one was metal and one was plastic. And when you spun that around four or five dozen times, the plastic got shredded by the metal and then it was just stripped. Of course, your parent always said, don't turn it so fast, click one. And you, look, if you were on two and wanted to go to 11, you went, Vroom. you were not going to sit there going, tick. No way. You did boom about five, ten dozen times. It was done. Pull that thing off, put a pliers on it. That was our big challenge. Now we've got texting and Discord and social media groups and Instagram and Snapchat. And, and your children are doing all kinds of stuff they need not be doing. And you have no idea. And so you need to find out what they're doing and be their influencers. Because I can tell you right now, on those places, they're all learning what you thought you were protecting them from in school. They're all learning the sexual stuff you didn't want them to learn. They're all learning the language stuff you didn't want them to learn. And you thought you protected them from all that by bringing them out of school. But they're hearing everything that you would think that you didn't want them to hear all in those places. And that puts them at risk. And guess what? Most of your teenagers haven't had their eyes and ears and hearts open, and they don't necessarily believe what you believe because that hasn't happened personally yet. And you'd like to think, well, they're my child, and I raised them this way. They doesn't work that way. Not always. They have to have their own personal revelation of their creator, just like you did. You can just raise them up as best you can in the way they should go and hope they won't depart, but then you pray that Abba has, has that moment with them where he opens their eyes and ears like it says, there's no exceptions. He does some of them from the womb. I believe my daughter's one of those, only because you see her up there, that's, that, she's been like that since she was born. Okay, my son's not exactly that way. I'm not picking on him. He's like most of the other teenagers. They're not that way. And so don't be offended that I'm saying anything bad about your teenagers. They're like all the other teenagers. And they're at risk. And so I'm glad that Carrie brought this up. The main thing, Carrie, that we can do is understand and build a relationship where the most close they are to anybody is you. They need to know that you're, they can talk to you about anything, even if it's bad. And that even if they might get in trouble, it's better than not telling you. The thing they should be most afraid of is not telling you, it's lying to you or hiding stuff from you. That should be the biggest fear. And you have to communicate that. But you have to also keep your word. We talked about don't say something unless you're going to do it. 
You can't beat the proverbial you know what out of them if they do something wrong if you told them you weren't going to do that. Then they'll never come to you and share the stuff they're doing. If it was wrong, you need to still maybe give them punishment and whatever they need to have, but don't lose your temper. Don't make them feel like you now reject them. Tell them you will never do that and then mean it and don't ever reject them. That's what he does. That's what our father just showed us in that whole thing we read today, Nehemiah 9 and 10. He showed us that he said, look, I wasn't happy with a lot of the things you did and oh, you blasphemed and you did all this terrible stuff, but I never stopped of being aware of what you were doing and having compassion, mercy, and love for you. As parents, we need to do that. And you need to become their closest confidant, their closest everything. And not just the one who's always telling them no and this and, and scolding them and, and yelling at them and everything else that we do. Build that relationship. Spend the time. You got to spend time to do it. You assume naturally I'm their father, I'm their mother. Well, I have that relationship. No, you don't. You got to develop that relationship and nurture it. And if you think you have it, they could be lying to you. They're good at that, by the way. They'll show you what they want to show you. I'm just telling you from all the counseling I do, this is all true. And don't be naive about it. And children that are here, and they might hear this later, know that we love you dearly. And all of this is not because we're trying to make you sound like awful kids. You're exactly the way we were. We just didn't have the access you have. There's no difference. We're not claiming that you're worse than us. As a matter of fact, some of us probably wouldn't have made it to this moment if we had had the access you have. Because we'd have gotten involved in so much stuff, we never would have made it this far. And some of you know that's absolutely true. But we didn't have the access. Okay, we didn't have the access. And so... Children, we love you, and we want you to be safe, and we want you to be successful, and we don't want you to be influenced by those who don't actually love you. And I'm not talking about another teenager that says, I love you. <laughs> don't be influenced by them. When you're ready to actually counsel for marriage, then you can be influenced by that person. Because that person actually does love you and wants to spend the rest of their life with you. If you're not at least 20 years old or 19 years old, I don't even want to hear it. Okay? Don't even, don't even bring that to me. You're going to change that, most people. Some of you are married to your childhood sweetheart that you met when you were a young teenager, but most, that's not usually the case. Okay? Most people have had their hearts change so many times between 12 and 20 that it can make your head spin. Let's let the right influencers be the right influence. And if you're going to be that influence, you better be a good influence. Your children, if they're watching you, make sure you're setting a good example. That was a mini sermon. Thank you very much for asking that question, Carrie. <laughs> It'll make a good afterburn, I suppose. Go ahead. What else you got? Okay, I've got uh, two more, and Rick Barry will have to forgive me, but his is a little lengthy, so I'm going to go with Leanne first. Uh, Malachi 3 is the refining purification of the Levite priesthood what Yeshua did by rebuking the scribes and Pharisees and with the destruction of the second temple? Mm, I think it's a part of the process. I don't think that's actually the refiner's fire. I think, you know, running them through the fire is meant to get them specifically to Teshuvah. Wiping them out doesn't really do that very much. Okay. Um, so I think that it's, it's more of a process of leadership, understanding in the priesthood their role correctly and getting themselves vertically correct. And you see this happening from Nehemiah forward or from Malachi forward many times, but only for short periods of time. Because look, the Israel makes this, uh, this commitment um, at Nehemiah's time. You see that with Hezekiah, but then the next king, they go bad. The next king, they go good. The next king, I mean, so it wasn't like it lasted very long. We're very short memoried people. And so our commitments don't tend to last as long as we'd like it to. And if we get it right, doesn't mean the next generation gets it right. By the way, for the parents and for the teenagers, I'm probably going to try to develop some more programming specifically for them. Okay? Where I will spend more time with them. I know the teenagers here really loved it the one time I uh, took their class. Okay? I got one in the back nodding and one in the front nodding here. Okay? So I'm going to try to spend more time with the teenagers. Um, I think I demonstrated to them that I understand how hard it is to be a teenager. And I think I surprised them a little bit with that. 
and that I said that it's not a problem, that you are who you are, and we'll work together to get you from where you are to where you need to be. And so maybe at the feast, we'll have some more time that I can give to the teenagers, etc. I know we have, you know, a program for the Godol class, which is the 12 to, I mean, 13, what is it, 13 to 19? But I think I need to be involved more, and I'm going to try to do that more. I can see that now with my, both my children, who are, my son's 14, and my daughter will be 13 next month. Having two more, having two teenagers, I'm starting to see the issues much more clearly. Look, it's just like when I first started ministry, I was married for five minutes, and so it was really hard for me to counsel people having marriage problems. Because after all, I had never been married for more than a few minutes. I mean, I, I almost started ministry there, like within a year after getting married or less. But now I've been married almost 20 years. I understand marriage a whole lot more than I did then. Okay? Doesn't mean I know everything, but I certainly know a lot more after 20 years than I did after two, one or two years. Well, the same thing with children. Okay, I understood children. I didn't understand teenagers because my children hadn't become teenagers till now. Now I'm starting to see the teenager stuff. And so I'm learning about that even more. And that's the way life is. As you experience it, you understand it better. So we'll do more, hopefully. So that was Leanne's question. Now you've got a longer one from Rick. Yes. Uh, what is the correlation between Nehemiah 9.13 and Acts 2.17-18 with regards to the prophets warning his people, not necessarily foretelling future events, and have we not had prophets since Yeshua was physically here in the flesh, and will we not have more such prophets until he returns? Also, in keeping Yah's appointed times, Shabbat, feast times, etc., in some sense not also considered a tithe of our time, Say that one more time, the last part. Okay, that, that actually I think was supposed to be a second question. In keeping Yah's appointed times, is that not in some sense a tithe of our time? I don't think it adds up close to 10%, so I would say no to that. But, um, of course, if you had all the Shabbats in, there's 52 of those, so that kind of, you know, adds some time into it. But we should, we should be uh, understanding when it comes to the prophets... Look, I think there have been people that are prophets. I think we have prophets today. Not the way Christianity teaches it, though. Remember, a prophet, by scriptural definition, is one that speaks the word with authority. Okay? And so we do have people today. Okay? I'd like to believe that some of what I do is prophet. Not for the title or anything, but I speak the word with authority. If that's happening, that would be what a prophet would look like. Nothing big and glorified and, you know, wearing certain clothes and only going. But it's that, that's what they were happening in Moses' day. When the anointing went on to the 72, that those guys were started speaking like Moses. Speaking the word with authority. So yes, we have those guys. But there were the rare few that spoke also the warnings. And now we, the prophets of today, read and quote those warnings to rewarn everybody, saying it was bad then and people didn't listen, so you ought to listen so it doesn't happen to us too. So we don't have fresh prophecy. And I know there's a lot of people out there claiming they're fresh prophets and all this other stuff. I, I'm not buying into all of that. I'm sorry. That's just the way to build kingdoms onto yourself and get some sort of power structure. All I think the prophets today are doing are reading what's in here and telling us how it applies to you today and get in line with it. See yourself in what Isaiah said and Ezekiel said and Jeremiah said and Hosea said and Amos said and all the rest of Malachi said, look for you in that. And a teacher who's going to do that is going to be in the role of prophet at that moment. Doing the cry aloud, spare not warning, do these things or we're going to see problems, okay? If we don't do these things, we're going to see problems. If you do the right things, we're going to see the good stuff. I said it, I didn't say it exactly the way I wanted. Do these things or we're going to see problems. If you do them, we'll see the good stuff. Well, that's where we're supposed to be. That's the role of prophet, okay? It's not the role of a teacher. The teacher is the one who's going to teach you. When I'm teaching you the mechanics of tithing, that's the teacher, Okay, but I'm telling you all the ramifications of doing or not doing it. That's more the profit role. And by the way, don't get hung up on the titles. It's not like that's a big deal. All of the internet, is going, Rabbi Steve thinks he's a prophet. No, I don't. It's not, don't turn it into that. Okay, Christianity's already done that with all of the fivefold things. Like it's a big title thing. Don't get hung up on the title. Okay, if you and I are sitting in the hospital and your spouse or child is in, the, you know, in a surgery and I'm giving you comfort and I'm there with you and I'm giving you that, that nurturing, I'm shepherding. All right, so now I'm not changing titles all of a sudden, but that's just what I'm doing at the moment. 
If I'm teaching you the basics, when you, you're brand new at all this and you don't understand the feasts, and I'm explaining the feasts and how to do them and when they are, I'm teaching. So let's not get hung up on the titles. So to Rick, yes, there's a correlation between those kind of things in Acts and in other places. They're relevant for today. I don't think that we necessarily have people. There will be two witnesses, and those guys will be saying the kind of stuff that these guys said and even more powerfully. Those are the guys that I'm looking forward to hearing from, the two witnesses, okay, that we read about in Revelation. But other than that, we just have hopefully anointed, appointed people that at times can walk in the role of prophet by speaking the word, not only with authority, but with explaining the relevance for you today, applying it today. Not the ones that say, Yahweh told me to tell you in some brand new thing, blah, 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 blah. Run away from those guys. That's just my opinion. I'm not trying to disrespect anybody, but I've seen a lot of that, and it comes from all kinds of, I don't know where it comes from, okay? Let's not do with that. You want a prophet? Go find somebody who's reading the word and teaching it with authority and showing you why and where and how it's relevant to you today. Okay, just so you know, as we're waiting for the children, my heart, this is maybe like it says, the heart of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers, we need to focus on that. Okay, and my heart is for the children. And I know your heart is for the children. That's why we bring them up and put them under the chuppah. But we have no idea how dangerous their world is compared to our world. Because your world was dangerous in certain neighborhoods. Their neighborhood is exact. They can access any neighborhood anytime they want on their devices. You can't keep them away from those neighborhoods unless you take away the devices. That's a much scarier place. And it's unfiltered. I know some of you can put Net Nanny and other stuff on computers and things, but they have too many accesses, too many devices. And guess what? Even if you block that all on your kids' devices, all they got to do is hang out with another kid and they got other devices. And then they're all on the one device watching YouTube or watching something. So unless you can control everybody's devices, everybody's access, your kids have access. They'll find it. So the only thing you could do is build your relationship with them and become their strongest influencer. Pour so much love into them so they won't seek it anywhere else. Affirm them, encourage them so they don't seek it anywhere else. You know, give them that so that whatever it is that they might seek anywhere else, make sure they're getting it from you and they won't need to find it anywhere else. Especially, I'll say, especially for you dads, you fathers, Especially with your daughters, you want to keep them out of trouble, you get a real good, solid, close relationship with your daughters. Because what they, what they want and should be getting from you, I mean the proper stuff, they go seek other places. You give it to them, they won't need it anywhere else. And that's why we end up with all these conversations with all these girls all focusing at early ages on, on liking these boys and wanting boys. and all that. Well, maybe this because they're, they're, you know, daddy's not around to give them the right attention. And make, where well, I'm using the right words, to give them the right attention. But make them safe and secure and loved. And then they won't need to go anywhere else. And the same thing with the boys. Take those boys under the wing. They want to become men. Help them to make independent decisions, but guide them. Guide them. Tell them when you're proud of them. Tell them when you're disappointed. Tell them how to be doing the right thing so that you'll be proud of them. Tell them the path. It's all making sense. I feel like I want to give a whole other sermon. There's my boy. Anybody wants to come up and wave Shabbat Shalom to those on the live stream? I will send away. See, this is the breaking of a generational curse. See, I would never have done what he just did with me to my father. See, that relationship has been fixed and restored, and we're going to set a new pattern. All right. We didn't move the lectern, but that's okay. We can get everybody squeezed in here. Isaac. Oh my gosh, he broke a smile. I've never seen that. Yeah, no, he smiles all the time, silly boy. Okay. Shabbat!